Okay, so, um, you know, we have finished last week looking at the training of the 12. So we are already into uh, the last six months of Jesus' ministry. So if you remember, we saw, of course, Jesus is eternal in his divinity. So when he was born until the time he started his ministry, the Bible tells us it was about 30 years. All right. And so when he came down from Nazareth to be baptized, uh, that marked the beginning of his six months initial Judean ministry. Uh, so that's where he ministered. He uh, got his first uh, disciples. He encountered his temptations. Then he uh, went up uh, to Cana, did some miracles, came back down for the Passover, uh, performed more miracles. Uh, encountered uh, Nicodemus, then he went back up to Galilee through uh, Samaria. Then he spent 18 months, so a year and a half in Galilee, in his great Galilean ministry. And we saw how uh, there was initial excitement, you know, people were flocking to him. But when his teachings became more uh, difficult, obscure, uh, and Jesus, of course, purposely did that in, in, in telling parables so that those who are meant to hear will hear and those who are not meant to hear, uh, they will not hear. Uh, so a lot of people stopped following him. And, and one of the reasons why was because um, the religious elite were against him. So thereafter, uh, this 18 months um, uh, training, he took his disciples aside to pagan lands. This is what we saw the last time for six months, uh, where he trained them in uh, Phoenicia, in uh, Tyre and Sidon, uh, in the Decapolis, uh, and uh, you know also back in Galilee. And what was very disappointing that we saw was uh, even though he spoke more forthright, uh, plainly to them, Yes, there were some things that they got, but there were still a lot of things that they didn't get. And as a result, uh, they continued to uh, argue with uh, one another. Uh, they continued to, to um, exert themselves and they wanted more influence. So uh, it was at this, it's at this point where after Jesus finishes his string of the 12, that this is where he begins his descent into Jerusalem. This is where, now if it wasn't bad enough before, this is where he um, accumulates uh, greater hate uh, from uh, the religious elite. This is where he performs, uh, not that he did not perform great miracles in Galilee, because that's exactly what he did, but here he performed uh, a great miracle, such as the raising of Lazarus, and uh, miracles that were very much more in your face in Jerusalem, where people uh, would, would, would be upset with him. Now, you might be wondering, why does he do this? Uh, because Jesus had a reason why he came. He came to die, right? And all throughout this time, Jesus had always told his mother and other people, oh, it's not my time yet, you know, but now this is when he would start uh, the acceleration of his um, passion, him going to the cross. So here we are considering the later Perean and Judean ministry. It's about uh, six months. So we see here uh, that um, uh, Jesus came down from Galilee through Samaria uh, into Jerusalem, right? And he would spend time in the region in Judea where he ministered. Thereafter, he would go over uh, to Perea, right? This is the region of Perea where he also ministered. And then he came back to Bethany where he performed that great miracle of raising Lazarus. And this is when, you know, his fame really exploded. Now, it's, it's not that it was not, uh, he, was, he was already hotly spoken about, but here was when uh, they took counsel to kill him. This is when they said, we really need to get rid of Jesus. And then he went to uh, this town called Ephraim. Now, in the Bible, 
uh, we know that there's a tribe called Ephraim and a region uh, here, which is Ephraim, but there was also a town in Judea. So let's not get it confused, a town called Ephraim. And thereafter, he went back down to Jerusalem. So this is how he spends much of the last six months of his uh, life. Uh, the final week, of course, the Passion Week, we will look at uh, in the coming uh, weeks. Now, what was the mood during this time? As I said, you know, Jewish leaders, they sought to take and kill Jesus. So, you know, we'll be doing um, somewhat of uh, uh, some Bible reading. I thought it would be helpful. So we look at the verses themselves. So let's take a look at John 7, verse 30. Uh, can I requ uh, request someone to read this? John 7.30. And of course, again, please don't wait on one another. John 7.30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. All right. So it became a lot more obvious now. They were sending troops to get him, guards to get him. They even took up stones to, to stone him. Uh, so... The reason why Jesus went to such regions as well uh, was not only to up the ante, you know, uh, he was sent to die and this is where his hour had come uh, or it was coming. So he had more miracles and harder teachings, but at the same time, he was cautious, yet he saw that urgency because he knew he had limited time. And what do we say? You know, in, in such times when we know that we're going to die, we're, we're going to say the most important things. He had already said some of those things to his disciples. They weren't ready yet. So now, uh, you know, he was still preaching to them and the people around him. So when we talk about the later Perean and Judean ministry, we actually see three divisions. So the first is mid-autumn. Uh, where he went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's around September, October. Then he uh, would go around the region, and thereafter he would return to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, and that is in December or late winter. And thereafter he would go to Bethany, and he would raise Lazarus from the grave, and that would be early spring. So this is almost at the Passover when Jesus will go to Jerusalem for his final leg of the journey, final week. All right, so when we take a look at the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem, let us read then uh, John 7, 2 to 9. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. John 7, 2 to 9, it says, Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doest or doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Uh, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, and the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now, notice that it's not that he did not say it's not yet come, but it's not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So we see, uh, you know, as this Feast of the Tabernacles was coming up, uh, we see that his brothers who did not yet believe in Jesus. So these are the half brothers. Uh, they, uh, they admonished him. 
So this Feast of the Tabernacles was really a week-long celebration where families would camp out in tents. This is where they remember God's faithfulness to Israel during the Exodus. So you, you have in the Bible a lot of prescriptions as to what you have to do. You have to build tents. You have to live under them. And, and the purpose of this was to remember that during the wilderness, this is how they live. And so Jesus himself would have spent this feast uh, with his family, right? Either at home or they would take a pilgrimage together. They would travel together just as the merry band of, uh, you know, uh, Israelites in the wilderness traveled together for 40 years. And the fact that the brothers, half brothers, said these things to him would have been very, uh, would be very sad, you know. Uh, e essentially, what did they say to him? They said, you know, show your works openly in Judea. Don't only stay here in Galilee. You know, if you if you say you are who you are, then show your disciples who you truly are. Don't just hide out in this backwater of Galilee. You want to be in the action. You call yourself a rabbi. You are the Christ. Then you just go to this place where everyone will know who you are. And your disciples, you know, all not just your 12 apostles, but all these people who are following you, they will know who you are. And not only that, to show the world, right, who you are. Just go and... Um, you know, there was a bit of sarcasm. It was sardonic here, right? Because if the Messiah is supposed to come in great power as the prophecies uh, denote, then why hide out in Galilee, right? Don't just say that you're great. Don't just, you know, stay here in Galilee. Go, go to Jerusalem and demonstrate this great power. You know, you really want to be that Messiah, then, then go there. And what is sad is, you know, as the text tells us, uh, the brothers did not believe him. They only believed who he was uh, after the resurrection. And this tells us that uh, they were the same as all the other disciples that had left Jesus. They were all, they were like uh, the other Pharisees, or maybe not as bad. They acknowledged, they saw all the miracles but they refused to let the miracles authenticate uh, his words, his claims. So we see here that Jesus didn't have the support of his family. So Jesus was saying, you know, you go to the feast, right? But my time is not full come yet. So I'm going to stay here in Galilee. And, and so that's exactly what happened. They would have gone down to the feast, right? Uh, but he stayed behind, uh, I think also partially, you know, everyone had been following him. The Pharisees had waited for him to see of Galilee when he crossed over in the boat. So he wanted to keep it low key. And it's not that he wouldn't go, uh, but that he wouldn't go in the way uh, that they asked him to go. He wouldn't go openly because he didn't want to attract uh, attention. Now, uh, usually how the people would travel is they would um, they would not go through Samaria, right? Uh, because this was the land of the pagans, right? But rather they would travel in a different way uh, to get to Galilee. So Jesus did not travel to Jerusalem in the traditional uh, Jewish way, just as when he uh, after his uh, initial. Uh, Judean ministry, he went through Samaria, and that's why the Samaritan woman was very surprised that he as a Jew would speak to her, but Jesus again went through Samaria, and he spent, you know, a bit of time in the Samaritan villages, all right, so after they departed, Jesus went secretly, now uh, we should not fault him, I don't think you know, uh, we can actually say, oh, he say one thing, but do another. No, Jesus was very clear that he was going down, but not in the way that they had prescribed for him. And how do we know that he was, uh, you know, resolute in going down? Because uh, Luke uh, 9 tells us that. Can someone re read uh, Luke 9, 51 to 56? Luke 9, 51 to 56. You can read. 
yep, Luke thank 9, you. 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Okay, thank you. So he traveled by Samaria. Uh, uh, why did he do this? So that he wouldn't be noticed because during pilgrimages, there would be crowds and crowds of people and he wanted to enter into Jerusalem unmolested. Now, we know that during this time, uh, the Samaritans were not as forthcoming as in the beginning. You know, in the past, the Samaritan woman spread the news abroad and there were many people who believed in him. But now as he came down, there were people who did not believe in him. And so much so that, uh, you know, uh, James and John, the sons of thunder, they wanted to call down fire to destroy them. But of course, Jesus himself said, you know, this is not the spirit of the son of man. You know, he has come not to destroy Right, but to save man. Now, uh, so there were several things that we have to take note of. Uh, the fact that the Samaritans who once supported him no longer did. The fact that his disciples were behaving in such an you know, uncomely uh, manner. But also the rest, not just the 12 apostles, but there were some disciples who were now wavering in their loyalty towards him. We see here in Luke 9, and I will read uh, verse uh, 61, or, you know, from verse 57, uh, we see that, um, you know, there was a certain man that came to Jesus. Uh, he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Then Jesus says, are you really sure? I've got no place to stay, right? Uh, but follow me. But then the guy said, well, let me go and bury my father first. So we see a flip-flop, don't we? You know, it's kind of like um, Boaz when he told the near kinsman, you know, Naomi has a parcel of land to sell. You know, will you redeem her? Oh, yes, I will redeem her. Uh, then if you redeem her, you have to take uh, 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 Ruth as well. Oh, I cannot redeem. You know, so it was a flip-flop. I want to follow. I will follow. But after, you know, he said, you know, there are no, uh, you know, uh, you know, foxes have holes, whatever. And, and so there were people who were there who heard all of this exchange. And another guy was not willing to follow Jesus. He said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. In other words, you know, not to attend the funeral, but, you know, wait many years before my, uh, after my father dies, and then I will come and follow you. So, you know, there were disappointments along the way. Right. Uh, these disciples wavered. The Samaritans refused. James and John, you know, were behaving in this way. And so you can imagine the kind of sorrow, conflict in the heart of Jesus. So when he finally came down to Jerusalem, you can be sure that uh, you can either say that the Samaritans, James and John, and all of these other disciples prepared him for the disappointment in Jerusalem, uh, or you could say it increased it, right? So uh, in John 7, 11 to 59, uh, Jesus arrived at the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. And um, uh, let me just read John 7, verse 10. John 7, verse 10 said, uh, uh, when his brethren were gone up, meaning that they went to uh, Jerusalem by the regular way, Jesus also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So he came to the feast of the tabernacles, but uh, we learn in verse 11, the Jews sought him at the feast. Uh, they said, where is he? So what he desired to keep secret uh, was not secret. And we learn here 
right, that um, the Jewish leaders were already wanting to uh, seize him, all right? Uh, because in verse 12, right, verse 12 of John 7, uh, there was murmuring among the people about him. Some said he is good, others say, no, he deceives people, all right? And, and so there was already such a talk, all right? And so the, the, the Jewish leaders were making preparation uh, to seize and put him to death. So we, we learn, as we read in verse 12, there was a divided opinion about him. There were some people who had heard about his ministry, had seen him, but the reputation, depending on who you listen to, what you see, uh, which crowd you're in will determine your opinion. Uh, now, what we also see in verse 13 is uh, they spoke, they did not speak openly of him for fear of the Jewish leaders, all right? So the people knew, but they were trying to keep low key. Uh, so he was there in Jerusalem uh, at the start of the festival, but halfway through this festival week, Jesus appeared and he taught in the temple. Verse 14 says, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So very likely, you know, he was not in the temple. He, 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 he was in Jerusalem, but only midway through did he go to the temple. And this is where he taught. Now, uh, almost immediately, controversy uh, broke out, right? Uh, Jesus taught. The, the Jews were marveling in verse 15. Wow, this man is not educated, doesn't seem to be, right? Uh, how does he know uh, his letters, right? Uh, now, now, was this meant to be insulting? I'm sure some people meant it to be insulting, right? But I guess other people said, how does he know, you know, so much? And then Jesus said in verse 16, my doctrine is not mine, but it belongs to God, all right? So, um, so we, we learned that uh, people were opposing him after he said some of these things. In verse 20, the people answered and said, thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee, all right? And then Jesus also, uh, you know, answered the charges that they had. You see, this was a common uh, charge that the religious leaders had, that Jesus had a devil uh, because he healed on the Sabbath. Uh, to them, they could not imagine, they could not fathom how someone who was from God would do such a work on the Sabbath, right? Um, this was their understanding of the law. This is not God's understanding of law, but this was theirs. And so uh, it really centered around uh, the Sabbath. His authority was challenged. And what we do see is that... Um, you know, there were a lot of people uh, who responded well to him. They believed him. Other people also hated him, all right? Now, we continue on, right? And I think it's important to know about this Feast of the Tabernacles. As I said, it was meant to commemorate the 40 years of wilderness wandering. And the, the way they celebrated it was significant as well. Tabernacles all around the temple in people's homes that were erected. People would sleep outdoors. And I suppose it's rather pleasant, you know, in mid-autumn, uh, neither too hot nor too cold. Uh, you know, they were out there. And it was a real, really nice time of gathering. And uh, they lit the lamps in the court of the women. Friends and family would gather. Now, consider this backdrop, okay? Now, on the last day of the feast, uh, Jesus taught uh, that he was uh, the living water, okay? Um, and this is where he invited the thirsty to come and drink. Now, this is significant. He had previously, and, and uh, sorry, and he will also speak about how he is the light of the world, but here he's speaking about how he is uh, living water. 
And we know that during the wilderness wandering, uh, water um, came from the rock, right? When Moses struck it, uh, uh, and God fed the people with this living or moving uh, water. And so Jesus used this opportunity uh, to point to himself. So here, whereas in the past, he would charge people, oh, don't tell people what you saw. I don't to tell people who I am. Uh, but now he was making a very bold statement that he was living water. And you know, during those days, uh, water was poured out as an offering each day. So it was part of the ceremony. And because he said this, uh, there was also reaction against him. You know, some liked what he said, and they would say, oh, this is the prophet that uh, Moses predicted would come. Others said that this was the Christ. And again, there were people who said that he was possessed. And because of such a commotion, we see in verse um, 44, uh, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. And then we see in verse 45, uh, then those who wanted to capture him, uh, the officers, they came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and then they were questioned, why, why have you not captured him? Why didn't you bring him to us? And then the guard said, you know, wow, no one spoke like this man. And then the Pharisees also asked, you know, uh, are, you, are you deceived, right? Um, are you deceived by him? So they were under orders to capture him, but they were unable to. Even the guards were amazed. Then we see one wonderful thing, right? Uh, and we see a parallel. Hopefully we can see a parallel in the scriptures. The first time Nicodemus came to Jesus was under the cover of night. Here, right, this was in the temple, which was lit bright <laughs> with light. And he did not come in secret, but in verses 50 to 51, right, it says, Nicodemus saith unto them, to the whole Sanhedrin, this was the one who came to Jesus by night, right? Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So he was speaking up for Jesus because they wanted to get him. And so the majority of the Sanhedrin now, they said, hey, you mean you're a follower of him now? Are you a Galilean? Right. And, and, and this was very insulting uh, for several reasons, because a lot of the uprising against the Romans uh, came from Galilee, uncouth, right? So they were accusing uh, Nicodemus of being uncouth. Secondly, uh, Jesus was a Galilean. You know, he probably had a Galilean accent, right? Um, and, 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 and so they were people who were uh, less religious. And so it was really pointing to Nicodemus being, if you're not for us, that means you are less uh, religious, Right. And of course, uh, you know, they were accusing him of being one of Jesus' disciples. You know, all of these fishermen, uh, tax collector, uh, a zealot, right? Uh, so this is what happened when Jesus went to the feast. So he departed from the feast. But remember the backdrop. What feast it was, the light so because they could not capture Jesus, uh, you know, with the, with, the, with the temple guards, because they were even amazed, what happened is in the end of John 7 and the beginning of John 8, uh, we see that they tried to trick and discredit Jesus. The Pharisees, uh, they brought down a woman caught in the very act of adultery. They wanted to test him. They, it was set up, right? Um, so... Right in, in verse 53, it says, you know, after this whole thing, the debacle at the temple, every man went into his own house. All right. Uh, and this is where they went to plot. Then uh, in chapter eight, right, 
uh, we're told that when they went to plot, they went every man to his own house. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Then the next day he came to the temple. This tells us that they were busy. They immediately did it uh, because when does adultery usually happen? Uh, not during the day, uh -huh, right? It usually happens at night. So this was an immediate thing that they did where everyone went into his own house. Jesus went to the uh, Mount of Olives. He came early in verse two in the morning to the temple. Then that's when the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery, right? So it was planned. But the question was, where was the man? This was something that was planned. Uh, now, this is uh, implicit. I can't prove it. Uh, but, you know, these men were so intent on killing Jesus, uh, getting him, they were willing to sin and commit uh, the act of adultery. So while I can't exactly say, oh, you know, the man was someone that they got, it could very likely be the man was one of them. You know, uh, they... Uh, you know how the Jews um, in, in the book of Acts uh, 20 something, is it 25, 26, uh, 24, sorry, I can't remember where they made a vow, a, a, a vow to the death, right, to kill Paul, either they kill Paul, or they, they themselves would die, right, so this was something that they were willing to do, they were willing to sin, right, to get at Jesus, so consider the backdrop of this feast with light uh, and, and, and darkness, right, uh, and they said, Jesus, what should we do with this woman, now we know when we take a look at the, 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 the scriptures, especially, let's say, Numbers 15, right, uh, where it speaks about the rules and the laws on atonement, when it came to the law on adultery, there was no um, forgiveness. If they were caught, there were two or three witnesses or whatever, then uh, the two people will be put to death. So they asked Jesus, right, uh, they said to him in verse four, master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So it was in the very act they would have the man as well, right? And they said in verse five, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What, but what sayest thou? They were testing him. And, uh, you know, if Jesus were to let her go, then he would contradict the law of Moses. But if he condemned her by saying that she should be put to death, then this was their way of getting him in trouble with the authorities because they would say, here's a man who wants to put, and he's an influential man, he's causing foment, and you know he's telling people to put this woman to death. And in the context of Roman rule over uh, Judea at that time, it would have uh, raised the alarm of the Roman governor because only they were allowed to carry, the, uh, carry out the death penalty. So, so what should Jesus do? You see, for many of us, uh, we tend to speak uh, very quickly. Uh, Jesus, what he did uh, uh, in verse six, he stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So he wrote on the ground. Now, what did he write? We're not completely sure, but we see internal evidence in the text uh, for the word write is the Greek word katagraphini. Uh, uh, which basically means to uh, write. So graffini or gra uh, grapho means to write, right? Kata means to be against. So the word uh, means to write down a record against someone. So it may have been very likely that Jesus as the omniscient uh, son of God was writing down specifically the sins that these men had um, had, had committed. And as a result, right, uh, we, we see that they, they left one by one as their sins were revealed. And before this happened, uh, Jesus said to them, he, in verse seven, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, All right? So adultery, uh, what was required was a public execution. So he put it back to them, right? Uh, 
uh, you know, if you have not sinned, right, and he was writing down their sins, right, writing down a record against them, then you be the first one to cast, whether to obey the law of Moses, right, or whether to disobey uh, Roman law in, in, in each circumstance, right? If they would obey the law of Moses, they break uh, the, the, the law of Rome. If they were to break the law of Rome, uh, they, uh, if, they, yeah, if, if they did not uh, kill her, then they were breaking the law of Moses. So he, he himself put them in this conundrum. And so they walked away because they knew that, uh, you know, he did not fall into their traps. Uh, so they were too convicted uh, and uh, to do anything, and they were too cowardly uh, to break Roman law. So again, the backdrop, they were doing everything in secret. Every man went to his own house in the cover of night when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives the next day early in the morning, then this is what they did. They brought out this woman. So they plotted all of this in the cover of uh, darkness. Now here, after what had happened in uh, John 8, verse 12, uh, we learn that uh, almost immediately after this, uh, and this was uh, in the temple because verse two says early he went to the temple. So they left away from him. Now he would have had a crowd around him. And here he spoke to them in verse 12. I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So this was his big public reveal. Now, it's not his only one. It's not his first one. But imagine the backdrop. In the temple, the court of the women was lighted, uh, was lit, and then there was uh, this dark plot by the Pharisees where he revealed the sins of the Pharisees. And so this is where he says, um, you know, the light shineth in the darkness. All right, this is what uh, John 1 says, <coughs> light has come into the world. And when was Jesus born? Uh, remember, we went through this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in one of our first lessons. Excuse me, we, we saw <coughs> that Jesus <coughs> was very likely born uh, in September, October, around the time <coughs> of the Feast of the Tabernacles, because he came to dwell, he came to tabernacle amongst us. And so now he revealed himself as the light of the world, that God was his father. And uh, the Jewish leaders, you know, they were uh, angry with him. Um, let's see, uh, where is that? In uh, verse 33, right? Uh, he says, God is my father, right? And then the Jewish leaders in verse 33 say, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free, All right? And then Jesus himself, uh, you know, said to them, all right, before uh, Abraham was I am, and, and they, they wanted to take up stones uh, to kill him, right? Uh, this he says in verse 58, Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. And the result of this encounter, I would encourage you to read uh, John 8, the entire chapter. What happened is they cast Jesus uh, out of the temple, or rather, they wanted to take up stones to throw at him, uh, but uh, to show that they rejected what he said, they did not believe in him. Uh, what he said was blasphemy uh, to them. And, you know, Jesus had until now spoken clearly to his disciples, uh, but it was here at this stage that he clearly revealed, uh, you know, who he was. Uh, he's living water, all right? Uh, he is the light of the world before Abraham was, I am, all right? And so 
uh, he, he went out of the temple and no one was able to get him. So we see what is amazing here. Uh, Jesus, as he preached, there were some who believed and there were some who did not believe. Now, in verse 30 to 33, as he spoke these words, right, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall, be, shall make you free. So in the temple, yet yeah, many people, right? Some believed on him, and Jesus was speaking these words to him. Then in verse 33 onwards, all right, you say it, you, you hear these words, they answered him. These were not the ones who believed on him, but the ones who were there who did not believe on him, you know, and said that we be Abraham's seed. So here, what is heartening is, as Jesus said these gospel words to prove who he was, uh, there were some people who believed, uh, some people who did not believe. And again, this takes us back to what Jesus himself said, uh, that people will believe in his words, some of them, and other people will not believe in him. So he, he went out of the temple. So this is the context here when we come to John 9, the, the, uh, the event that happened uh, just after they tried to stone him. He heals a man that was born blind. So the context was he had just preached he's the light of the world. Uh, but he is outside the temple grounds. So he saw this man uh, in chapter 9, uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 1, right? He passed by, and the disciples asked, who sinned that this man was born blind himself or his parents? And then Jesus said, no, but he was born for the purpose uh, so that the works of God might be revealed in him. Right, and also that it would reveal who I am. So he he spat on the ground, he made clay, and he anointed the eyes of this blind man, and he told him to go and wash in the pool of uh, Siloam, which means to be sent, right, or to flow. Now, why did Jesus do this? This man was present there by the providence of God. This is what this man was born to do, to reveal uh, to others who Jesus was. Now, Jesus, and this was the Sabbath. Uh, uh, we know it's a Sabbath because, anyway, I'll let you go uh, look at it. Uh, verse 16, uh, this, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. All right, so very likely... You know, uh, this was the Sabbath in which it was uh, done as well. So, so Jesus uh, was very forthright in doing some of these things. Uh, and he made this mud and spit concoction. Now, why did he do that? Uh, some people will say, you know, ew, it's so uh, unhygienic. I think there are several reasons. Um, some commentators have, have offered certain suggestions. Uh, I don't find all of them um, plausible, you know, but there's the, the cultural thing where <coughs> rabbis and, and people in the past, they said uh, that spit was uh, uh, something that could clean, could heal, right? <coughs> uh, so it was a folk remedy. But the other one that makes more sense is that God formed man out of the ground, from the dust of the ground, from mud, all right? And so I think Jesus here was, 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 was making a point. He was the light of the world. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, Psalm 104 tells us that, you know, God wears light as a garment, all right? Uh, he sends it forth as a curtain into the world. And now Jesus was coming in full force. He had just articulated, you know, he was able to write down clearly, you know, the sins of the people on the ground. He knew all things. He was omniscient, right? 
And here as the great creator, he himself formed that mud, he placed it on the eyes of the man. And he told him, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to go to the pool of Siloam. Now this was the temple here, albeit it was outside of the temple when this happened, but where would this blind man have been? He would have been here at the Southern Steps. This is where the pilgrims would come and they would sing the Song of Degrees as they were going up, right? And so uh, a lot of pilgrims would be here. They would see this blind man. They would take pity on him. So Jesus, you know, in front of all of these people, uh, healed the blind man, put mud on his eyes, and told him to go all the way down to the pool of Siloam. Now, this blind man didn't know who Jesus was. He was not there with the commotion, uh, and he was blind. He did not know. But when Jesus told him to do this, uh, we are told that he went there. Now, if you were blind, you know, why would you bother to go all the way down? And this was uh, um, during pilgrimage. The streets would be packed, jam-packed with people. But the man came all the way down, washed in the pool, <clears throat> And in order to come up. Now, why did Jesus tell him to wash there? You know, it, 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 it could be a test of faith. You know, th this, it, but I think most of all, it was to demonstrate. You see, it becomes less problematic for us when we know that this man's destiny is the reason why he was born to do this very thing. So it's no surprise that God could move the heart of this man to do this thing in order to show the kind of hunger, the kind of obedience that he had to Christ. So uh, the Pool of Siloam, this is uh, where we will be visiting. Um, uh, as you recall, we did it in our uh, brief OT uh, Bible survey when Hezekiah was in uh, Jerusalem, uh, when the Assyrians were outside and they were um, uh, holding siege uh, uh, so that no one could come out or go in, Hezekiah um, built a tunnel, dug a tunnel, so that water from the Gihon Spring could be diverted into the city so that they could withhold and withstand the trial. And we're told that 185,000 uh, Assyrians were killed on that day. Um, you know, by, by an angel sent from the Lord. And the interesting thing is, sorry to, you know, jump back over there. Uh, we see the providence of God so amazing. If you recall, uh, it was Hezekiah, or, or rather it was Isaiah who was sent by God to tell Hezekiah uh, that he would die, he would not live. And Hezekiah had boils all over his body, right? If you remember, uh, he had very likely what was the bubonic plague. And so when Hezekiah, when, when Isaiah told him he would not live, but he would die, uh, Hezekiah turned in the privacy of his room and pled with God. And as Isaiah was walking out, midway walking out from the palace, God told him to go back in. And uh, Isaiah made a poultice made with figs, you know, to heal these boils of Hezekiah, this bubonic plague. And um, it was Josephus who recorded for us that the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, uh, they died of the bubonic plague. So, you know, when we think of Hezekiah, we think of uh, this pool, uh, it is the healing that comes from God. And the God that had delivered the angel of the Lord, uh, who had delivered uh, God's people by the killing of the 185,000 Assyrians, you know, was the Lord Jesus Christ who now healed this man, not with a poultice of figs, you know, but with a solution made of uh, spit and mud as the creator. Right? And, and so this was a wonderful thing. The man uh, uh, came back up, he was healed, and the Pharisees, they interrogated him, uh, and he proclaims that Jesus was a prophet, because, uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> who can do this except a prophet from God? He says, 
you know, God doesn't listen to sinners, which is true, uh, but a worshiper, him, he hears. And the, 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 the Pharisees got so upset. They said, who are you to teach us doctrine? You know, uh, you, you were born blind. You know, we, we, uh, you know, we have Moses as our teacher. Who is your teacher? You mean that, that, that fella? You know, and they could not see beyond the fact that Jesus had healed. So this, again, has that theme of light uh, and darkness. So whereas this man was born blind, uh, he was able to see, right? Whereas the Pharisees, uh, they could see, uh, but spiritually they were blind. And just as Jesus, you know, was cast out of the temple grounds, he walked away from their midst, um, this man also was cast away uh, from the temple grounds. And what we learn in John 9 is that Jesus eventually found him, revealed to him uh, who he was. Um, you know, and, and it's beautiful words here. Uh, the fact that Jesus says, um, I am, you know, he that speaketh to you uh, is the one, right? It says uh, in verse 35, uh, do you believe on the Son of God? And the man says, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Then in verse 37, all right, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And we see here that Jesus, when he received the worship, uh, showed himself uh, to be God. All right. And as he was speaking there outside of the temple, you know, um, in verse 39, uh, for judgment, I'm come into the world, they which see, so that they which see might not see, they which uh, see might be made blind. And then the Pharisees were there in verse uh, 40. And so they said, you know, Jesus was very clear in the things that he said. Uh, you know, he was speaking Asian style to someone, but he meant it for the Pharisees who were also there. And they said, are we blind also? Are you saying that we are blind? And then Jesus essentially says, if you were blind, uh, you should have no sin, all right? But you now say we see, therefore your sin remains. The fact that they really could not see who Jesus was, they were, they still remained in, uh, in their sins, all right? So he was using this miracle to illustrate the depth of the spiritual blindness in the Pharisees. So, you know, uh, we will be walking through the old city, right, where uh, we will see how crowded it is. And, you know, it is nowhere, we, we, we cannot fathom what it was during Jesus' time because Jerusalem was destroyed. But if you see the kind of streets uh, that Jesus would have walked through, um, you know, uh, you, you, you can see the kind of narrow streets of cobblestones that this man would have had to traverse through in order to get to the pool. Right. Now, um, okay, so here in John 10, uh, after Jesus was conversing with this man outside of the temple, uh, he was there you know, uh, by the doors uh, of, of, of the gates, uh, the gates of, of, of the temple. And so here he uh, did his discourse on him being the good shepherd. So here, the context, again, we have to see there's every, re there, 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 there's a reason for why Jesus uh, chooses his words carefully in his teaching, especially during this time. Uh, he had already accused the fair of being blind. Now, Jesus was going to use this to accuse the Jewish leaders of being false uh, shepherds, right? So uh, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees had already done, uh, you know, showed them to be false shepherds. Uh, they, they were upset that Jesus performed miracle on the Sabbath, but they were willing to stoop to deception, right, to get at him. Uh, they were so blind. So in this discourse here, right outside the temple, you know, uh, he said he called himself the good shepherd. And he contrasts himself with uh, the hireling, the, the false shepherds. 
you know, and even the wolves. And here in this discourse, he said that his sheep comprise of more uh, than just the Jewish people, but also the Gentiles, uh, saying that, you know, the very sheep, that these shepherds, the shepherds of Israel, uh, would not shepherd. So here, uh, yeah, he, he, he was accusing the Jewish leaders of being false shepherds. And again, the reaction to him was mixed. Uh, and, and we see what John is trying to, to show here, that there are those who would trust in Jesus. My sheep hear my voice, right? But others, they won't hear his voice. And why was all of this done? For the very simple reason that Jesus' hour was about to come. It was not full yet come, uh, but he was doing all of this so that it would fully come. All right, so uh, <clears throat> we're still at mid-autumn. Jesus uh, here now uh, avoids Jerusalem because if he had stayed, the guards get him, the people tried to stone him. You know, if he had stayed any longer, uh, his uh, time would come sooner uh, than what was stipulated. And we all know that Jesus had to die on Passover itself. And so he departed and he ministered in Judea. And this is where he had disciples with him. Don't forget, not just the 12 apostles, but whereas in the past in Galilee, he sent out the 12 to preach in Galilee. Now he was sending out the 70 to a much larger area. Now in our grand old translation, uh, the King James based on uh, the received text, uh, it says 70. Uh, in other versions of the Bible, it says 72. So I'm not going to go into you know, why there is a difference, right? Um, but what happened is this was a uh, much larger number uh, to uh, evangelize <clears throat> a quite a large area as well. So it was in Judea, but it was likely all the way to Perea as well. And, uh, you know, let's, let's take a look at Luke 10, verse 18. Can someone read this, please? Luke 10, verse 18. Oh, we read from verse 17, 17 to 18. Can someone read this, please? Luke 10, uh, verse 17 and 18. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, here, you know, in the various ministries, uh, you know, the 70, we learn in verse, verse 17 that uh, they return with joy. And even the devils, uh, they were exorcised by the name of Jesus. Uh, we do know that there was also a mixed reaction but here Jesus predicted <clears throat> that Satan as lightning will fall from heaven, all right? He, uh, he will have his downfall, all right? So what is the message here to his apostles and his disciples? Despite what they were experiencing uh, in Jerusalem with many people, well, some people believing, you know, others not believing. And here, as they went out to minister, some believed and some others didn't believe. But eventually what will happen is uh, the kingdom of Christ uh, will be built upon the gospel. Right? And uh, not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. All right. Now, during this time, uh, no, I, no, I don't think I can finish that. So anyway, <laughs> I was hoping to get to uh, winter. But I think it would be good just to stop here. You know, we've had a, a, a uh, long evening. Uh, 